bit of anger there. And what I realized is that I was angry because I didn't know why I was angry. And I think that same scenario can apply to every emotion of depletion that is normalized. You know, some people are groomed in an environment of violence exactly. where abuse is normal. And for me, I'm in a season where I am learning to take a step back. And by take a step back, I mean recognize that I don't need to be in control. And that relinquishing control is, in fact, giving myself control back. That's good. Keep at least peace of mind. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Peace of mind is important. Yes. It's giving myself control back in a new area of freedom in which areas in my own life in which I can control, that I have neglected because of the fact that I've been worrying about everything else out here. And I think that refers back to being stuck in that place of, but they did this to me, but this happened to me, to me, to me, and being on that rat wheel of mm -hmm mental torment yes. that self mental torment and what you're looking for an emotional savior and in so like you said it's okay to be in that space and cry it out and repeat the story and repeat the narrative and want help and want all of these different things to justify what happened but the ability to relinquish that is the same ability in which you have to accept your own freedom in allowing the future to, to be to be available to you. Because as long as we run forward looking back, you you're more likely to trip and recreate the past. Yes. Versus, you know, accepting what happened, living with the living with the reward and the understanding of of, of growth. And, and moving forward with the consciousness and the understanding that you've overcome something. And so I'm just in that season where I'm truly accepting and understanding the view in front of me and what the future has to offer. And, but also being mindful of, I think too, when, when something, whatever that situation is that's happened, we always feel like, you know, well, I'm not going to recreate that, or I'm not, you know, that, that rage, that anger, or even just the excitement and the adamance of not wanting to do something propelled you in the complete opposite direction. And I think we've spoken about that before, but making sure that that balance is there between you trying to go the complete opposite and, and, and truly being aware of what your options are to create a new in your own experience. I know what you, what you said. What you were talking about was the repetition, what they call the repetition compulsion. Okay. And most people have a compulsion to repeat the past. It's something in us that subconsciously we're driven to recreate that traumatic point in time so that in the recreation, of course this is subconsciously, to in the recreation, we can either master master it this time. Exactly. Uh, they abused me, but this time I'm going to be the abuser. I'm going to be the So you either master, so you repeat it to either master it or undo it. Exactly. So it's interesting that you yes. basically <laughs> described that. But for those people that are psych psychology buffs out there, they might appreciate yeah. the, 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 the nomenclature, repetition compulsion. Does that? Yeah. Were you breaking down the American dream? <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just, you know, messed up. and that's exactly what you were talking about about living in that that out, even though you moved from Texas mm -hmm. and and you created this new life for yourself, you were still coming with that demeanor that you did that you that you were clothed in that consciousness of anger. Yes, and so the recreation could have easily been. 
well, I'm gonna prove them wrong. And you could have created a whole new environment of angry people. You could have attracted all of these angry people yes. and relived Texas right here in California. <laughs> you can't have that yourself. Exactly. And so on that exact note, that is, I feel like, the power of this conversation of healing and allowing the Most High to do a work now and, and not waiting because we could be running from the very thing of Babylon and recreating that <laughs> in the process. Taking it, back taking it, taking it, it with you. With you. Yeah. Exactly. And another thing, too, is really important to a lot of times when we're in that situation where something has been done, it's almost like something in me, like you were saying, I'm going to get over on you before you get over me. But we're also looking for an apology. We're yes. also looking for somebody to say, I'm sorry, you were right. You, I did, you know, I'm sorry, I forgive me. But you can't do that because it'll keep you in there. They're broken. Let it go. You don't have to remain on that same cycle. If you never, if you apologize to me, and if they can, they will. If they never apologize, I can't let that be a hold on me. Yes. And I have to be free of that. Yes. I can't look for you. It won't. As soon as you apologize, and if, and if you don't have that in mind. We talk about changing your perceptions, your opinions, and your attitudes about different things. If they don't apologize to me and I'm looking for an apology, I can't develop a relationship with them because that's going to be between us. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's yeah. going to be between us. You didn't apologize to me, so something in me has not totally, I'm, I'm, I'm here with you, I'm talking to you, but it's not about this you. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> there was a story in my family. I had an aunt that had a mother that sent her and her sister away to live with my aunt's mother, which would have been their grandmother. Every time we would go to a family reunion, year after year after year, there would be these three ladies that would sit to the table together. They didn't talk. They just looked mad all the time. So I asked my mom, I said, what is the problem with this? I said, this happens. Every family reunion. They sit at the same table, they have their backs to each other, but they don't talk. So she said, well, you probably don't know the story. I'm like, no, I don't. What I discovered is that the aunt that lived in my town despised her mother because her mother gave her away and didn't come back and get her. So this woman literally Whenever her mother wasn't around, we would all get together and we are not, we could just be having these conversations and all of a sudden she'll say, you know my mom didn't raise me. And you go like, where did that fit in the conversation? You're like, like how, how, how did you just pop that in the conversation? We're talking about A, B, apples, oranges, and you just bring F in, like, <laughs> But that was so heavy on her heart that she could never forgive her mother. She contracted cancer, would not get treatment, she literally dried up and died at 60 some years old. My mother went to visit her in the hospital a few weeks before she passed. And she begged her to forgive her mother. And her words were, I will never forgive. Well, that's a clear example as for how forgiveness is for us. It ain't for them. <laughs> so get your forgiveness today. It's $3.99. <laughs> $3.99 like that. But, but man, um, also about Pat, um, this is all related to passing under the rod because uh, related to the repetition compulsion, you're not going to be repeating your shenanigans over there in the land because the land's going to eject you. This is why this is why we're doing this so that people can so so that the Most High can begin to help you pinpoint what he wants to what what he wants to work on get so get delivered. And, and, and get the healing that's readily available right now because there's certain behaviors that are not going to be acceptable there. <laughs> Absolutely. And so um, if you read, I think it's Ezekiel 20, where he talks about bringing us out of the country, dealing with us face to face, and then he says, passing, you're going to pass under the rod. And if you notice, after passing under the rod, he says, then I will make a covenant with you. But then I'll make a covenant with you. So um, so there's an inspection that takes place. 
So that's what we're all encouraging people to do is to, to pray and seek the most high. What is it that he's pinpointing in your life right now, just as he is with all of us, and cooperate with him so that you know you can pass your inspection. Amen. I think it also points when I hear this conversation, it really makes me wonder like the spaces that were never there for men. You know, with the same we went through the same exact type of traumas. But because we had men who didn't who weren't raised by men, anytime they come around other men, the only thing is, oh I have the answer. You need to do this. You need to be like this. And we find ourselves in a position where instead of learning how to be men, we're trying to already prove that we're men. You know, and everywhere you go, there is no healing space. There's no place for you to acknowledge or even deal with what you, or even try to make sense of anything that you've been through. And so you see how lost and no direction has been a, a applied in a lot of this awakening because everyone has all of these ideas. Um, how to come together, how to form a nation, or to put it on scripture. Scripture says we're gonna become a nation in a single day, okay? But everything starts in seed form, right? There are things that you were supposed to be intentional um, about as well. And so instead of being able to move forward with plans on going to the land, everyone's avoiding the biggest thing. And scripture says, love the most high with all your, all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. But none of us know how to love our neighbor. None of us know how to deal with, with each other. And so I think for, the, for, for men specifically, we need to take a moment to realize what doors have been opened from the voids that have been there. Because different things that have gone on, these voids uh, happen in each one of our lives, but we end up filling them with overindulgences. I firmly agree with you that there is no space for men to gather to talk about the various levels of healing that they need that are distinctly different from women's needs. Um, and for the past week, I've been brainstorming with Sarah as to how <clears throat> men can have a platform, a space, whether it be a parent group or a men's group, um, but there needs to be a space for um, not wound healing, not just wound care, but to really nurse um, scars, okay? Because there's a lot of us who just didn't go and get the necessary uh, sutures, uh, you know what I mean? High duty type of wound care, and now we just have scars, and we're raising up kids that um, don't have scars, but have a worldview that's based off of our scars and our wounds it's not fair to them and it's only because we weren't able to help healthily talk about um what did or didn't happen in our lives so i, I agree you know one of the things when it comes to men is that hollywood has shaped our view of what a man that you want in your life should look like and because of that sorry to say that we treated you in a created image and a created picture that you never should have been put in. You should have never been put on a, on a, in a place where you had to carry, have, have to have all these qualifications in order to be a part of my life. Mm -hmm. That's what society did. In their own home. In their own home. I'm, I'm watching the Housewives of Atlanta and, and you walk in the door because you're coming from your regular job and instead of greeting you in appreciation for what you're bringing into my home, I look at you with disdain because you don't make enough money. You don't take me to the highest level that I should be. That's a, that's a, that's a Babylonian mindset that has been put inside of us that we didn't play our parts in helping you become the man that you should have been able to become. We as mothers raise men, raise little boys because the father wasn't there and we took a role that was never ours to take to try to do a job that was never ours to do. 
So we as women need to apologize to you as men for not accepting you for the way he created you to be. You are fine in your own right. You are perfect in every way. You are the king and the Lord and the, and the master of your, of your life. And when you take me in, I should be the kind of person that sees the value of what you want to become. He said, I was your help me. I should have been standing right on the side of you. What is your dream and what is your vision that I can help you become? We didn't know how to do it because society gave us a bigger picture of what you should have been. No. 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 A scripture comes to mind um, where the Father is saying that we are accepted in the beloved. Well, now we know it's accepted in Him. But that did something for me, for my own personal self and esteem when I realized I'm accept accepted. Because so many times when we are growing up, in different circumstances and different situations, we don't feel like we belong, or we don't feel like a part of it, or you know, you're looking. I should do somebody else is doing this. I maybe I should do that. When we can accept ourselves as we are, it's the beginning of a healing. And so I'm saying, like even with the men, with the women, with all of us, when we can accept the fact that what she's saying is right, that did not happen. However, the Father sees me. He sees my potential. He sees my abilities. He is appreciative of who I am. He loves me just as I am, not as I should be. He even accepts me where I am, not where I think I should be or somebody else thinks I should be. And that goes back to what you were saying, where the women are looking at a man, they want to, they have a certain idea of what a man is supposed to be and what he's supposed to contribute. But when I can look at you and accept you as you are right now, I can come alongside of you. Mm -hmm. I can accept you where you are right now instead of looking at where you, I think you should be. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that validates a point that Sarah had brought up earlier in the conversation of how our whole pursuit of finding a mate is thrown off because of this, this construct. If we were going about finding a mate based on their level of health and how they looked physically fit to run the marathon with you, as opposed to running the race and, you know, tonight wasn't as good as I thought it'd be, <laughs> on to the next suit, you know? So if we pitch, picked our spouses, our partners based on their, phys their current physical or health condition, um, and, and if that paralleled yours, then that could be a better uh, uh, illustration as to how successful that relationship might be as opposed to what they have or don't have right now mm -hmm. uh, in the construct of Babylon. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I was gonna say to what you were saying before Mama Michelle about apologizing to our brothers, our fathers, our, you know, Sons. black men in any any relationship, um, that part of that apology is the acceptance within knowing who we are as women and saying that this next step of walking closer to what the Most High has called us to within the kingdom is going to look different and accepting that it's not going to look like Babylon. And one of the most beautiful stories that I heard of recently was actually a YouTube couple that talks about finances. Mm -hmm. um, and within their, their story as a couple, they were engaged looking, they were engaged getting ready to get married. And um, the husband or the fiance had done everything that he could in admiration and respect for this union that he was getting ready to create with his finances. He, and there was a level of shame that he felt uh, um, about a past debt that he had and he didn't tell his soon-to-be wife. Um, but he was actively working to try and, you know, pay toward the debt before the marriage. 
and it was three months, I believe, before they had gotten married, and um, the the wife or the fiance found out, mm -hmm. and she talks about how crushed she was in terms of the faith, and three months before they're getting married, finding out that they have all this debt, or how could you lie to me before this, you know, this union? And so she talks about how she was at this crossroads of do I get married to someone who just lied to me you know it, just this whole back and forth and she talks about how it took so much prayer and so much fasting of seeking the most high of whether or not this is something she can do but the testimony is, in it is that all of these months and years later they've been married for 10 plus years mm -hmm. and here they are you know seven plus six seven plus figures and they built a marriage and a foundation and a whole business about mm -hmm. coaching people for their finances. And it's such a beautiful story to say that it didn't start out, start out with him having racks and racks and racks of a savings account. Yeah. It took his infidelity, or what they call financial infidelity. Mm -hmm. um, I'm glad you clarified that. Yes, yes. <laughs> financial yeah. infidelity yes. to, to humble herself, humble himself enough to acknowledge his debt and then her respect enough for her husband to still believe that this man could lead her, but yet that he would have to adhere to some of her strict, you know, guidance as a wife. So for the first couple of years of their marriage, I mean, she was debt free. She, you know, had prepared in that way for marriage, but he had to get, you know, use her strength to yeah. learn how to, you know, take under his, some of his unhealthy financial habits. Mm -hmm. And so for year, first couple of years in their marriage, she took care of the finances. Mm -hmm. But then she even realized as a wife, I don't want to have to manage him. Yes. So they, as, as a couple, had to work together and say, this is the commitment that we're working toward within our union. And this is what we're going to birth our children out of, mm -hmm. is this place of, it may be your weakness, it may be my strength, but when we talk about oneness, when we talk about a union and a relationship, it's the idea that maybe that what the Most High is calling us to in this, in this new season of, of freedom is not going to look like something that is fully healed, but what it's on the other side of it is what's going to impact the kingdom and influence the kingdom of, of you know, the nation and generations to come. Yeah. One of the things is, <clears throat> this is the thing that grieves me, and this is something that I had to learn. I love the book of Genesis because it's always taking me back to the beginning, which always exposes roots of things before me. What is the root cause of why I do what I do? When, I, when you think about marriage, you have to go back to the situation with Adam and Eve. People often talk about that story, but they forget one thing, the rib. The one thing that brought Adam and Eve together was the rib. In any relationship, whether it be whatever, how do I fit? What is my part that I play? Sometimes we get into relationships, whatever they are, and the grief comes from when I don't know my prospective place. I do have a place in a relationship. Feminism, feminism and all these other worldly mindsets have, have made us think that we are above reproach, that we don't have to submit. Submission is not to condemn you. Submission is not to, to put you in bondage. Submission is putting you in a place where you can fit. Submission makes me fit where I need to fit. It brings order. It brings order to what needs to be. If I don't think about the rib, if I if I only <coughs> the part of the story where the, where the rib is, I'm never going to fit in any relationship. He said she was a help meet. Now, in a business relationship, that principle applies. If somebody's in a relationship as a business partner, what is your strength? What is my weakness? If I allow your strengths to, to strengthen my weaknesses and allow my weaknesses, to, my strengths to, to improve your weaknesses, what happens will fit. If you are a man and you are a woman, you don't have to wonder if you fit. You fit. 
you fit. But that's the key. We have to always not overlook the rib because that is the thing that brought Adam and Eve together as a united front. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's, I'm glad you guys brought up the male perspective because the Lord was talking to me about that over the last day or so. I don't know, I should say the most high, not the Lord, but, um, but, um, in the past, I had always thought about like the Babylon way of male-female relationships. So I have the ability to see things that other people don't see in situations and people. So I'll see something. Um, in the past, I would see something and say, okay, I see that problem. That is... Um, not able to do what you said, which was uh, <laughs> accept them where accept the person where they're at, come alongside and assist. But I see the problem; I don't like it, <laughs> so therefore, you know, I'll see it. Um, so over over the years and through being healed myself, having to come to a level of healing to be able to to do that, to be able to say okay, I see the problem, um, I see the problem, most high, how can you use me to assist that man? That's because true. women, we need to realize most likely in a lot of areas, we're ahead of the man. Whether it's financially, whether it's dealing better with our emotions and healing and all of that, we're ahead. So, so in Babylon, we're taught that that a certain a certain uh, way of male female relationships. So when we look at our personal situation with our with our Bantu men, and we don't see that, and we compare it to the Babylonian the Babylon way of doing things, it's like it doesn't match up. So I'm kicking him to him to the curb, and I'm moving on to the next one, right? So what the Most High was showing me that now I have a level of he can trust me to come alongside to assist that person to get to where they need to be. Mm -hmm. Because as Bantu women that fared better out of slavery than the black men, we're going to be ahead in a lot of ways. We have to come alongside in a lot of ways and, and help them get to where they need to be. Um, so as the Most High is showing me things, and, and my level of maturity, and this isn't, and I, in the past, it, you know, I'd be mad. He, I, I would see something, I'd be mad. You know, I'd say, oh, I see, it's like, oh. You know, but, oh, I'm too through, I'm too through. But um, now I see, okay, I, I'm hearing what the Most High is showing me, okay, praying about it, okay, and then I go to the person, and then we have a discussion about it, and try and, minister to them to get them to where the most high wants them to be. So I'm saying all of that to address the bond to women. One, like you said, don't compare yourself to, to the Babylon way of doing things in relationships. And we are going, you're, you're going to have to grow, heal, get to the point where you can do exactly what you were saying, which is, I see the problem. And instead of and instead of judging, instead of doing all the other stuff and all the other antics, see the problem and minister to that person where they're at. That's right. And piggybacking on that, saying to the men, you have at this time of healing and restoration, recognizing what has taken place, you've got to be open to the Bantu women that are now in line, lining up with where we should be. You've got to be open to and see as well. You know, I think without it being, uh, being taken as a criticism or a judgment or whatever, but it's coming, no, you got to know that it's coming from a heart of love and a desire for to see the best. I think 
think that's interesting because my perception is that black men have never, well, I don't want to speak in absolutes, <laughs> but I think for, because, because Babylon has essentially switched the gender, gender roles, yes. because yes. the woman has been the dominant source the in the home the and essentially prospered from being the, the dominant source in the home. My perception is that taking instruction from a black woman mm -hmm. has always right. been the norm. Mm -hmm. They've always been the mother. And so it's it's more, and I think the quote unquote problem is that black women have been perceived as the mother. And black women who are single looking for, you know, husbands, they're not necessarily looking, but waiting to be pursued at the you know opportune time the the complaint or the idea is i'm not i don't want to be nobody's mom i'm not a kid <laughs> you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. so when we talk about that i think for me for me i can only speak from my perspective but i understand that that the how i have been raised by a black woman with with only the understanding that my mother had to offer being, you know, the head of her household, that's how I was groomed. So I was groomed in confidence, groomed in leadership, groomed in, you know, uh, to, to be outspoken and all of those ways. So my lesson has been to how to submit to a man. And within that, exactly like what you were saying um, about seeing something, knowing the problem, yes, the immediate reaction is, Oh, I'm not dealing with somebody who doesn't know that, or you don't know that, you know, or you know, belittling something. And I think that is the behavior that that that, that makes it so a male wouldn't want to. Who would want to submit to somebody belittling them? Yes, yeah, right. And yeah. that has been my learning lesson, even in interaction with my own brother, let alone a, a person I'm interested in, you know, long term or intimately. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So my lesson has been, how do I take all of my, <clears throat> my confidence, all of my outspokenness, all of my rigor as this teacher and this powerful influence and this powerful helpmate and be just as much a learner? Mm -hmm. Because the best teachers are only students at the end of the day. And so that submission process has happens in the dark with the most high. Because my ability to listen to the Most High is going to be the same ability that I can, can, can listen to my husband with, yes. let alone, you know, hear my older brother. And so I don't think it's necessarily, in my experience, I don't think it's necessarily my brother's interaction with me or the next male's interaction. Like, can they submit? Can they listen? Because they already see me as an authority. I've already proven my track record. You having, you know, your finances in order, you having your health in order, these are, this is all your proven track record. So that already initiates um, enough interest in you as a woman and as an authority. So the question is, do they feel comfortable to take direction? Is this a welcoming place? I think of the scripture that talks about an angry woman on the rooftop. Woo! Yes. Or, or, you know, just how all of the... The angry woman on the rooftop, and how you know that's literally the nagging woman. The nagging woman and and that's her the husband ends thing. up on the rooftop, by the way. Yeah, yeah it's the husband that ends up. You know, they can't take it anymore. Exactly. <laughs> it's just she's so bad. It's just like <laughs> chalk on or fingernails on chalkboard. Mm -hmm. But what I'm learning to wrap everything up is basically that when a woman walks in the room, she sets the tone, and. Yes, she does. You, the power of a wife, the power of a mother. Um, Mama Nature always says, a wife is a wife before she gets a ring. Yes, she That's, is. Those are attributes. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm, I'm truly just learning that to use my power in a way that is supportive to not only myself, but to other people in my presence. Yeah. And I think that's something that we weren't able to do because of slavery. Yeah. We couldn't maintain our own energy. We didn't have a release. Mm -hmm. We were walking around in bitterness. We were walking around in anger. So who would want to be around that? Yeah. Man, woman, boy, or child? 
You know what I'm saying? <laughs> exactly. So, in clarification, the statement that I made, I was coming from a standpoint of us women being healed. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so that there's a balance. Yes. So that they can trust yes. us, our information. Yes. You make a strong point. And I feel like the, the key thing out of uh, any relationship with all of what you're bringing to the table is balance. Yes. Um, most importantly, the balance that we're asking from our bond to women within this construct is not fair. And I want to make that very clear to you all. No matter what you bring to the table, no matter how, no matter how much understanding, support, <laughs> you are climbing an uphill battle in a place where the ceiling looks this high. However, there's a glass ceiling and you'll never make it to the top. That's if you're trying to pursue a healthy bond to first relationship in battle. I just want to make that plainly clear. You will never win. You'll never get the relationship you want and reinforce community for your children and your, your grandchildren in Babylon. So even if you find your bond to king, uh, Miss Kim, <laughs> Within the United States, whatever flock you create, no matter, no matter the village you create with like-minded believers, they're being reinforced by the construct of Babylon. Yes. And their wounds that came from Babylon are still going to influence your kid when you, ba you let the babysit them for five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so, that is so true. Just be highly careful. Even if you find that, that person, um, the Most High has to take us to his promised land in order for any of it to work as he intended. Yeah. You know, the bottom line in any relationship, it doesn't matter whether it's male or female. When, when Adam and Eve was put together, it had a purpose. If we don't recognize that when he brings us together, it's for a goal. And the goal is not for what I can do for you and what you can do for me. The goal is what can I do to build the kingdom? If we don't realize that that okay, I'm going to use the term ministry. We all understand the term ministry. If he's putting you together, it's not for the purpose of just you satisfying each other. Because if Christ is not the middle or uh, Yesai is not the center of your relationship, all you're going to do is magnify each other's faults. You, you're not going to see what the Most High is building in that person. So if I take my eyes off of him, put them on him, I can see him through his eyes, and I can see a purpose. I can see his destiny. He, he sees me through his eyes. He can see the destiny that comes together. Once we come together for the purpose and destiny, then we can create the Bantu family, the healthy, emotionally, emotionally healthy Bantu family that the Most High had intended for bringing us together in the first place. I know that's a long way around, but that's the only way. I'm not marrying you just because you're cute and you got the part, you know, you, you, you know, six feet four. I ain't marrying you for that. Although that looks good. Looks <laughs> good. That's real good. Even with the, the bankroll? With the bankroll, with the Mercedes Benz, <laughs> with all that. If at the end of the day, the very thing that I married you for becomes a thorn in my flesh Maybe because I didn't marry you for the purpose which he intended. Mm -hmm. When How many times do we see that in the whole Hollywood scene? And what happens if you lose all of that? Yeah. Where does that's it go? Mm. See ya! <laughs> and that's another, reason, that's, that's another reason in terms of not dating for potential, but dating for purpose. purpose. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. We'll have to get back to you guys on part two. <laughs> <laughs> now that, that we kind of dive into the relationship the, the relationship yeah. segue. But yeah. that was all encompassing yeah. of the womb of of the home yes. and the family yeah. that, that is, that that is yeah. germinating yeah. and yeah. recreating. And yeah. what we see is what okay. We look at the past so that we don't repeat it. Grief comes from what we've seen with our own two eyes. I moved from Texas because I didn't know any other way not to create what I grew up in. Mm -hmm. I had to move to a, a halfway across the country, literally, to keep me, to give me a different perspective. And when I go back home now, 
what I what I left, a lot of what I left is still there. Mm -hmm. So I know I made the right decision. So now that I have a different perspective, we, we know that, you know, the most high gives a lamb for every household. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you become the sacrificial lamb. I had to grow, I had to go to grow to go back so that I can help others grow. Right. I know we opened up the conversation talking about death. And I no, thought, no, it wasn't, it didn't have to stay with death. No, it mean, was, all of this was still related to me. Because mm -hmm. it's still about recognizing that we're in a healing process, yes. which is what's taking place. Right. And all of this is relevant to that. Yeah. And I just wanted to give the family an opportunity to grow within the avenue of death because it seems so uh, final. And in so many ways, we're taught that. Yeah. However, we were given an illustration earlier uh, in the book, which was very key to how we were brought into this world and how we were meant to think about life in general. Yes. Um, there's so many ways and spaces that has been reinforced and told to us. We've, we've, we've sang it time and time again, but this illustration really, uh, I feel like is the cornerstone of how we are to raise our kids, to inform them about their spiritual side as a living being. Yeah. Uh, and then how we can, in a very healthy way, talk about death mm -hmm. and let them know that because the physical is not here, that has nothing to do with the spiritual and how the spiritual is just as present as yes. the physical was. Yes. Um, and with that, they can keep relationships with family members they never even knew. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is how they can understand how mama still does this the way mom grandma did it and it have value to them as they move forward um, because those little tokens are what allow them to walk into the next phase or level of life with confidence from people they never knew yes. and i think that's a prime example of you know in the story of joseph where they in, in certain situations are able to tell their enemy I'm the, I'm the, I'm, my father is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Like, did you not know we <laughs> slaves such, such, you know, when yeah. we read that in the scripture, that is the significance of knowing, like, mm -hmm. do you not know who I am? Mm -hmm. Like, I carry that legacy, yes. you know. You know who my ancestors are. Exactly. And that's what we should be bonded to. Yeah. yeah. And not where we've been. But where we going? And that's beautiful because within this construct of Babylon, there's not man person's child who's a celebrity there where their kid goes to school saying, my dad or my mom is this. Yes. They're told to keep quiet. <laughs> but if you're a grandson, one who's promised from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you telling me you not about to tell every one of your friends the promise you were given? Yeah. You could give it only two. So if we actually can walk in our truth within this construct, we, we would be yeah. yes yeah. amongst the clouds. But that 400 years of slavery, the muzzle has been taken off. Mm. It's time to blow the ship far. It is time to sound the trumpets. And that's what we're doing by sitting here doing this. We're now blowing the trumpet. We are no longer under the effects of slavery. If you want to come out, you can. If you want to stay there, that's your option. But we as a people can't wait for you to decide what you want to do. We've got to go forward because we've got to make a path and a way for those that are coming behind us. That's right. And if you want to blow the shofar, take the mask <laughs> off your mouth and blow with us. Love. <laughs> <laughs>